Jazzcast Pros. How do we in this moment, I think we have a great moment here with this collective trauma and grief that we're going through in, in our community as a result of May 14th and other things. How do we get folks to, to really use all the tools that we have available to us so that we can heal individually and heal collectively? I think it begins with normalizing and, and sharing and being authentic. If we show people in that moment, listen, I'm a mess. If you didn't judge Jesus on the cross, why are you judging me? And I'm all human. And that is what people are looking for. People are looking for people to be real and authentic. Greetings. This is uh, Pastor George Nicholas, chair of the Buffalo Center for Health Equity, and you are tuned in to Igniting Hope podcast. This is a podcast that comes out of the work that we've been doing with the African American Health Equity Task Force, the Buffalo Center for Health Equity. If you want more information about any of the subjects or any things that we talk about on our Igniting Hope podcast, please log on to our website for the Buffalo Center for Health Equity, and that would be buffalohealthequity.org, buffalohealthequity.org. When you click onto our podcast, like it, share it, we have a whole uh, library of, of our podcasts that are still loaded up there and with some great, great guests, and we have another great one for you uh, today. A uh, quick announcement, we have our date and time for our our next Igniting Hope Conference, uh, Igniting Hope 2022, will be August 12th and August 13th at the Jacobs School of Medicine on the 13th, and we're still working on, uh, we're going to have a a Friday night celebration on August 12th. Uh, When you go to our website, buffalohealthequity.org, you'll be able to get the link on how you can pre-register. It's totally free, and we we want to uh, see as many of you. We really want to put a big emphasis on getting more folks from the community involved in in our conference this year. We got a lot of great academics and professionals who participate, but we really, really want to hear from you. So you'll get more information on subsequent podcasts, but again, buffalohealthequity.org and just put down August 13th. You will not, August 12th, August 13th, you will not want to miss this Igniting Hope 2022. So we're still wrestling with and uh, dealing with what happened to 10 of our, our beautiful, beloved fellow citizens brothers, sisters, aunties, grandmas, friends, husbands, these 10 people who uh, were needlessly and senselessly executed by uh, a a young man influenced, a young man filled with hate, but influenced by a culture that has, from its inception, not regarded the value of Black life. And he, being 18, caught up in that culture, took it to an extreme. And we're still dealing with the trauma and the healing that is necessary in our community. And what was so amazing about uh, this event at the Tops on, on May 14th was, or is, the fact that so many people who were not part of that community, uh, people who didn't live on the east side of Buffalo, people who didn't even live in the city of Buffalo, people who didn't even live in Western New York, people who didn't even live in New York State, were just moved by what happened. And some felt compelled to see what they could do in order to to help out. We received and continue to receive all kinds of cards and letters and financial contributions from churches and individuals and businesses all around this country saying, hey, you know, I I feel so badly about what happened and I want to see what I can do. And then there were others who who felt a special call. They said, you know what, not only do I want to send a card or a letter or flowers or whatever, I want to be physically present, not for a photo op, not for a drive-by, not for a press conference, but I want to be physically present and offer my gifts to this community. And one such individual is a woman named Troya Butcher. And and who is she? She came to us from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and she is the leader, founder, creator of the Good Grief Healing Center. And 
is a, a, a person who has a special gift, and a, but more importantly, a heart for a ministering, caring for those who are in distress, those who are, who are living with, with trauma. And so we're fortunate today to have Troya join us for our Igniting Hope podcast. And we just want to have a conversation about her experience down there on Jefferson Avenue, her interaction with the people, and what she observed and what is really important for us to learn and understand as a community moving forward. So, Troy, I want to welcome you into the space, and thank you so much for joining us for our Igniting Hope podcast, and, and also thank you so much for your offering of yourself to this community and using your gifts. So, let me just start with just, like, what drew you? Why, why did you feel compelled to to move from being uh, an observer of what happened in Buffalo to one that that felt like you had to be fully engaged in the in the repairing and the healing of our community. Thank you, um, Pastor George and um, Kimberly and Ebony for the invitation. What drew me here, you all, quite honestly, again being a grief support person, a grief support specialist. When I saw what happened, and a very good friend of mine is, not, is from this area, and he was struggling with what was going on up here with the with the shooting. And I said, well, if he's struggling, I know that, the, I mean, of course, everyone else is struggling with what's going on. And I just prayed and I said, God, if this is where I'm supposed to go. But it, it, it wouldn't let me, I couldn't sleep. I was like, I have to get there. And I had no way, I, I didn't know anybody here in Buffalo. And I said, but okay, God, if this is where I'm supposed to be, because this is my community. I may not live in Buffalo, but you all, well, this is my community. This is what I do for a living. And if I can't do it for the people that I closely identify with, my African-American Black family, then what am I doing? And we do a very horrible job of working and, and processing our grief. And I, and I just wanted to come up because I knew that the grief here was going to be compounded grief on top of everything else that's going on. And I just, um, I just felt that I needed to be here, and God made a way for me to come. So for me, it's a labor of love, and I'm just really excited and honored to even be up here working with, um, with this community. So when you got here, what did you find? So when I got here, I was very fortunate. I, um, I met one person, maybe and then so on and so on. And when I came here, I, uh, the top employees were at Merriweather, at the library in Merriweather, and they were... They were doing different activities, but no one had ever really asked them from a, from a, just a perspective of how are you feeling. And so what we did, we came in and, and I said, you don't know me. I don't know you, but this is who I am. And this is what I, I do. How are you feeling? What's going on? Where's your head and heart? And then we went through the exercise of, the, of, of our five R's. And they just, and at that point, they began to just release. And so many of them have said that they have not had the opportunity to do that in the two weeks. Because we got here Memorial Day weekend, which I think was, was the sweet spot for us to get here because of the things that they were doing. They were doing busy work, which they should have been doing, but to come in at that moment. Um, and we just saw people, at first, they were very angry. They were, they, and, and still are. They were, they, were, they were angry about what happened. They were angry that this young man chose their store. Um, but then you had others who they were mad at God. They were mad at, I mean, there was just a, a, a lot of just different emotions all over the board, all across the board. But the one thing that I, I will say that, um, that it was refreshing to see, but I told them they didn't have to be, a lot of them were just, they were just very resilient because they were leaning, which is very important. They were leaning on one another, um, through this, um, and what, what he thought was going to happen. Top, the family of two, top 250, they became stronger. The workers did, and they, they were beginning to lean on one another because apparently that store, everyone is really close. So that was refreshing to see. And then also, once we began to work through it, that they were really um, being there for one another. So one of the things, you know, Troya, that we do and is we at the Buffalo Center for Health Equity, Buffalo Center for Health Equity and and my personal journey is being an, an ordained clergy person, but also one that has some level of expertise, I guess some would say, around the issues of, of health equity and, and have 
gathered and tried to be a catalyst for uh, working on issues of, around health equity. And one of those pieces is of brown mental health, right? And and how you know we in the African American community have some really serious issues around mental health, around trauma, around grief, and how do we respond to it? And one of the things that's really hurt us historically as a community and continues to to hinder us is the inability or the theological approaches of not pulling from the great value that we have in things like mindfulness, meditation. We've been so conditioned in the Black church in so many ways to confine our dealing with trauma and grief in the context of the traditional church stuff, meaning pray, lay hands, anoint with oil, you know, and these things I'm not undervaluing. These things are very important. But in addition to those things, there are many tools that will help us as human beings, our humanness, to deal with grief and trauma. So talk about the importance of people of faith and people who who have a spiritual a spirituality grounded in, in Christian religion, not allowing that that to block them from accessing other tools that might help them with their, their grief and trauma. Does that, that make sense? There's a question in there somewhere, but you know what I mean? So, uh, but I think you know where I'm, where I'm going with this. So I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that. It makes complete and total sense. And I will tell you why. Um, I'm an ordained minister. Um, um, you know, my back story, I'm a pastor's kid. So we were taught, you know, not to feel, one, not to feel because we had to make sure everybody else was taken care of before we were taken care of. Like I said, it didn't, it didn't occur to me um, until 2013, 2019, when I had those significant losses, to even think of anything else except for, you know, the, the norm, um, to be absent from the body, the presence of the Lord, and to just continue all the churchy stuff. And after John died, I was like, I don't want to hear anything churchy. I don't want to hear absent. I don't want to hear any of that. And what? Um, and instead, I took myself to therapy, and then my therapist made me do some made me do different exercises to get my life together um because i just and, and and i think we do a, and so I, so now um with the good grief healing center one of the pieces that you, that we that i believe in is meditating and um, we talk about meditating on the, the word all the time but um which is great but sometimes we have to just sit still and that's the hardest thing i know for Troya. that's the hardest thing for us to do is just sit still so we can really truly hear and be in the moment because, and like the mindfulness, I took mindfulness training because someone asked me, I said, well, what is this? So I took it and being in the moment, feeling where we are in that moment and not worry about what's going to happen 10 minutes, 20 minutes, what's on your agenda, but actually being purposeful in self-care. And again, I didn't learn self-care until I went to seminary. And I was like, is that a thing? We can really, I can really not do anything. <laughs> so I think it's very important that we teach that. That's, so that's one of the things that we try to do is to say, yes, all of these things are true. The Bible is true. Everything, God, all of that is true. But um, Jesus also, God also said, uh, it's okay to be angry and sin not. And I wasn't feeling the church because the church wasn't there for me. So I had to do something different to bring me back to my first love, which was God, which is God. But me as a minister, I'm being, I have to be transparent. I had to do something different and being able to stay and sit for five minutes and not think about the next thing, but actually allow God to um, heal my, my, my heart, my spirit, because you can't, because you keep moving and moving and moving. Like you're, like you're, uh, uh, the target is always going to, the, the, the weapon is always going to find its target. And, and you're walking around with a big bullseye on your, your chest trying to outrun this, this, not trying to outrun yourself instead of just being getting at peace and being and being still. The Bible he gives us all of these things. Peace be still. <laughs> you know? But we don't use them. We just want to continue to the, the, the what is it, the the harvest is plenty but the workers are the workers are few. But if you can, if you're a better worker 
because you have you have set sat down with yourself and understand what belongs to you and what doesn't, then you can work better. Then you can you can hear God clearly on what you're what you're supposed to do, and not beat yourself up because a year after your, your loved one has passed on, you're still feeling it. You have every right to feel that. And you have every right to sit still with yourself and be quiet. That's a gift that we can give to one another, and I don't understand why we don't um, give that gift to our congregations, our parishioners, to say, listen, it's okay to not answer. We say don't answer the phone, but then you don't answer the phone, but there's a lot of busyness going on in the background. It's okay not to just answer the phone. It's okay at the same time to sit still for five minutes. Why we don't do that, I don't know. But my mission, my mission since I started the Good Grief Healing Center and gotten into this world is to normalize how we respond to grief, begin to believe that we can cry, we can be uh, a transparent in our feelings, and to just normalize this thing called grief. That's been my mission. So for us as, as African Americans, and we have a lot of stuff that we got to try to figure out about our own self-awareness and our understanding of God. So the way I look at it is we are an African people who are living in a strange land that is not our own. I mean, we're making our own. And we're trying to understand a religious context that was set in the East. Because when you look at the Bible, it's, you know, it was, it didn't happen in Cleveland, right? It, It, you know, these were, you know, the Eastern part of the world. And we try to understand it through an, through a Western interpretation, often, by European scholars and a European culture that didn't even recognize our humanness. So there's just a lot of internal conflict. And and one of the things that when we look at some of the spiritual practices in general that are not indicative to the Western culture, but more Eastern culture and a more Afrocentric culture, there is a greater awareness of self, of spirituality, of nature, of own internal emotions. And I think what's happens at times is, is we've been taught a colonialized theology that really in a lot of ways doesn't fit us. And we've tried to, to make it fit us. I'm not talking about denying the truth of, of the divinity of Christ and the, you know, the monotheism of, of the Christian context, but just the understanding of who we are and one of the things that that's happened, and we we'll respond to this, is we've been constantly under so much trauma from from beginning, right? And often the trauma is at the hands, or as a result of the very same people that are trying to teach us their understanding of God. And so it it, it creates just this this real conflict uh, within us, and so. I would argue that when I used to get mad at the church, but I'm not anymore. And people, they, they just don't do what they know. They do what they know, right? And we have to re-educate and almost deprogram our people in a lot of ways because there's a lot of people when we talk about like meditation, right? We'll still believe that that's, you know, demonic or or when you start talking about mindfulness or, or, or what you're talking about, you know, when you talk about being present with your own feelings and just, you know, all these kinds of things or telling people just, you know, just go for a walk out in nature and just allow for, for the trees and other things to communicate to you, right? That there's this, you know, these, because, because, because plant life and other things, those are, those are living beings. But when you start talking like that in some Christian context, we black folks, they think, man, that's, you know, Voodoo, or you know, you know, that's demonic and all this other stuff. And then they go back to their own playbook of what we've done for generations. But yet, if we look at data, we see that suicide rates are up, mental health problems are up, family crises are up, domestic violence up, all these things that are indication of a spiritual sickness, right? There's a social economic piece, but then there's also a spiritual sickness that's inherited in us and that at times we are not we're not fighting that with the tools that will give us the victory how do even the word enlightened right 
how do we enlighten because when you say that a lot of people think oh that's that's buddhism so no, it's, it's a word in the english language right and and an enlightened this means to get to a higher and better understanding right which you know it's important and so how do we how do we in this moment and i think we have a great moment here with this collective trauma and grief that we're going through in in our community as a result of may 14th and other things how do we get folks to to really use all the tools that we have available to us so that we can heal individually and heal collectively and then maybe you want to share a little bit about your five hours i think we, again i think it begins with normalizing and, and sharing and being authentic because we put pastors on the pedestal and we put all Christian leaders on a pedestal. Well, we all bleed the same. We all grieve. We don't grieve the same, but we bleed the same. And saying I'm broken and being authentic in that was well, um, Elder Troy, because that's what they call me. Elder Troy, what happened? I said, y'all know y'all can just call me Troy, right? But Reg, Elder Troy, how did you get from point A to point B? I said, I'm the other side of grief. And, and this is a process that, I, and I, it, even in, in, in somebody asking, do I do I speak about God during my 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 sessions? And I say, absolutely, I do. I don't try to convince anybody of anything. I just tell you what worked for me. And I believe if we begin to model what healing looks like and um, what what coming out of that uh, uh, getting your feet out of the clay, I mean out of the um, the concrete that has hardened, is what is going to help, <clears throat> excuse me help our people because a lot of us. I'm a visual by, I'm a visual learner. But if but if somebody's telling me, listen, I know how to get you here. I know how to help. I know how to help you here, and be authentic in that, and they can trust you. And I think that's the problem is that so many so many people in that pulpit, they don't want to show that they're human. They don't want to show their humanity. And um, because of it, listen, there was only one one God, one Jesus that came that was both a deity and who was she was human. I'm not that person. If you hurt me. If I don't pray enough, I'm gonna hit you. I'm gonna hit you in the mouth. But if I, but at the same token, Troya, I'm hurting. But you're, I'm looking at you, and you, you've gotten. How did you get past the significant, the significant losses that you had? How did you do it? First, I acknowledged who I am, and I was real with God. I was real with God. I'm not. I'm not happy about what this is. I'm angry about what this is. Troy, you said that. I said yes, I did. I said I was angry with God, and I said then I had to do something different. Because, um, you know, the same insanity is doing the same thing over and over, looking for a different result. And the result that I was feeling was I was broken, I was hurt, and there was nothing or no one that could help me. Then I had to turn to Jesus. I'm like, okay, Jesus, how do we do this? Now now I'm ready to talk to you. And, I was, and he was like, he never went anywhere, even if I did. God never went anywhere. He's like, listen, what is it, Matthew 5 and 4? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Okay, well, what does that look like? What does comforting look like for you? And comforting looked like for Troya is learning how to get at peace. And what did that peace look like? It looked like stopping for 10 minutes. And, 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 it's, and my, my grandchildren think I'm crazy because I'll, if the wind blows, I'll stop and put my hands out and just feel God's presence. Yes, yes. It's like, ah. Yes. And that's yes. not something I did, I did before. So, And I did that here. I don't know if it was coming at the hotel, but I just stood there and, I, and this, this wind just came and it felt like a kiss. It felt like God kissing us and saying, pay attention, pay attention. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm not just, I don't have to be loud and all. I can be just as smooth and clear as a whisper or just standing in the wind. And I think that is, oh, that is amazing. I'm sorry. You were going to say something. No, no, no. That's, no, no, you're right there. And it's a story that people think, and again, you can, you can send us thing, buffalohealthequity.org. My wife was telling this story about how, she and my son went out for a walk and stuff and she had read about how this thing about trees and communicating and how she and my son went out and they, and they, and they like put their hands up towards the trees, so a couple of trees. Right. And she said the branches basically bent down, you know what I mean? It wasn't like, you know, kind of a weird thing, but there was like, like a, a, a connection. Right. And, and so now half the people are listening to think I'm crazy, but that's all right. Because those are those are the only people that really know me. But 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 it's real and, and, and we got to learn how to 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 just we talk about how awesome God's creation is, but we don't even access most of it, right? We just want to stay in our little building and think that, that that's the only way that we go 
we're going to, I love ham and organs, but, but there's other things that, that God will use to, to communicate with, with his people. And we just have to be open uh, uh, to that because, because, you know, we have, it's kind of funny. You mentioned about ministers and preachers and whatever, and, 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 and we're self-deceiving when we think, even though we try to present ourselves as these super Christians or whatever, the people see our humanness. They're not stupid, right? But it becomes this, if I don't, if I don't show it, then you all pretend to not see it. And that's the game that goes on until it gets to a point of diminishing returns. And there, then there's an emotional eruption, right? And then we don't know what to do, right? We have to stop putting on masks and costumes and trying to create uh, something that's not real and just allow for me to see the real Troya and for you to see the real George and just love each other and love what we see, love what we experience and not try to shape or mold us into who we believe you ought to be, right? And then when you when you do come and you bear, you say, I'm hurting, I'm broken, to only be focused on what you can do as a human being to heal, not to judge, not to, well, see, Troya, I told you, if you, you know what I mean? I, I knew this day was coming, right? And all this other stuff. It, it, instead of just learning how to be prayerfully present in our humanness and get that kind of connection. And, and so, you know, we got to get to that point. And I think this is a moment in our in our history as a people because we're going through so much and the younger generation is looking and they're seeing that some of the, some of the old tricks just not working. And if we're true, if we're honest with you, they never really work, but we just made, we made us believe that. And now, but we're, now we're living on a time where we're much, you can't really hide a lot of stuff now, you know, because of, these phones and just, I don't know. We're just, even when you try to cover up stuff, stuff just kind of gets out. Right. And we got to be able to, to deal with it. So, yeah. So, I mean, what's your thoughts on that? And, and then I want you also to share with the people how they can connect with you of via the internet. Real quickly. So when you were talking, I just got this image. We were talking about um, showing people our pain, showing people our, our, our authentic transparency, one thing I told God, I said, you're making me preach. Because, you know, my father, I said, my, my brother should have been a preacher. But if you're making me preach, God, I said, you know me. I have to be authentic and transparent. But as you were speaking, I thought of the cross. I thought of Jesus on the cross. He, he was beaten. He was, he, he was chastised. He was, all, he was all of these things. And he stood there. He didn't try to get down off the cross. Blood dripping down. They said it sweat like, it was like blood. He showed us how to be in front of people that he loved, that we love because he showed us that example of staying on the cross because he could have chosen in that cup, in that moment when he said, God, if it's your will, can you let this cup pass? And he did it three, he said it three times, but he looked into that glass, he looked into that cup and saw all of us. And he saw all of us, um, but the deity took over the humanity, but his humanity was hanging on that cross and showing us, listen, this is what being a true leader and loving people at the same time looks like. It's going to be a bloody mess. But at the end of it, know that with the resurrection comes hope. And with the resurrection comes peace. With the resurrection comes love. If we show people in that moment, listen, I'm a mess. If you didn't judge Jesus on the cross, why are you judging me? And I'm all human. This was, and this is our deity. This is our God. This is our Savior. And that is what people are looking for. People are looking for people to be real and authentic. And I told you, I think I mentioned that I work with women who were um, in recovery. I've never drank. I've never smoked. I've never done any of those things. I said, but I had my own vices. And, and they said, Elder, we used to look at you up on the pulpit. And we appreciated the fact that you were open. And now that we see you, you're just human all day. I'm just human. I'm just Troy. Yeah. So, but with that, um, real quick, because I've some, one of my batteries looks like it's dying. That's okay. Yeah, we're getting close to our end of our time. So I just but, want to see, Troy, how can, how can people uh, connect with you? I'm easy. I'm at just Troy, J-U-S-T-T-R-O-I-A. That's all of my socials. Um, and then email, you can email me directly at hello at G G 
aloedghealing.org. That's aloedghealing.org. And we're just so grateful that, Troy, you were able to spend some time with us today. And we're grateful for you being in Buffalo and and using your gifts. We're thankful that you said yes when God said to go. And it's, you know, our hope and prayer that you'll get more and more integrated into the community and and get connected to to some of the things that we're doing here uh, at the Buffalo Center for Health Equity, uh, where we're we're committed to eliminating race-based health disparities uh, in, in this region. This is Pastor George Nicholas, who I have the honor and the privilege of being the chair of the Buffalo Center for Health Equity. And this is the Igniting Hope podcast. Again, I, uh, please mark down on your calendar, August 12th and August 13th for Igniting Hope 2022. It's going to be it's going to be a conference that you will not want to miss. We got some surprises for you. We got some major, major announcements we're going to be making at this conference. We have some some great teaching, but most importantly, we really want to hear your voice. Uh, you know, we're going to create spaces where the voices of the community can be heard. So, until we connect again with Igniting Hope podcast, this is Pastor George Nicholas uh, reminding you that we love you and to really. You know, show that love that's within you to your sisters and brothers in our community because one of the greatest healing powers in this universe is, is the healing power of love. So we thank you so much for listening to us today. Thank you. This has been Igniting Hope Radio Podcast. We thank you for tuning in for your weekly dose of hope. Western New York national and global listeners now have access to important content they need when they need it at home, at their desk, or on the go. So please go and check us out. If you're not already following us on Facebook, you can follow us on Facebook at Buffalo Health Equity. That's at Buffalo Health Equity. If you're on Twitter, follow us on Twitter at Igniting H, Igniting H. And if you're on Instagram, please go over there and follow us at Buffalo Center for Health Equity 18. That's Buffalo Center for Health Equity 18. Until next time, stay healthy, stay safe, be well, and don't lose the hope.